today, just as I give an introduction of my sermon, we are going to look at the signs of a lukewarm believer. When we say that someone is a lukewarm believer, what do we mean? And if I am there, then what can I do uh, so that at least I can come out of being lukewarm? I either become hot because there is no becoming cold. Uh, you realize that in this time and age, most believers come to church, yes, but you find that there is no excitement about hearing the word and being in church. Maybe church to some of us has become a routine because every Sunday you have to be somewhere. But if there was an option, maybe you could have gone for that option. So it's not just a matter of being uh, born again. We must endure to the end. We must overcome because that is what the, uh, God desires of us. Our love for God and the brethren is declining. There were times, even when you went out of Nairobi and you met a brother, indeed, you were so happy that you met a brother in the Lord. But these days, even when we are here in church and service is over, everyone wants to go their way. There's no sharing. What did I learn? What did you learn? That excitement is fading. And it's no longer there. Look again at how we clap when we sing. Even uh, if the governor of Nairobi came here, we might do better <laughs> than when we say, let's clap our hands for Jesus. Amma, we try. So we, let's clap our hands for Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's better. So you find that... Uh, Again, there is no excitement, there is no zeal in the things of God. Uh, one of the signs of the end times, when you read the book of Matthew 24 from verse 1 to 14, that is not my main text, but I, I found some things there that were interesting. One of the signs of the end times, and there are many, there will be deception of many by false prophets uh, who shall arise. Uh, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And yesterday we saw what Hamas did to Israel. And um, there shall be famine, there shall be earthquakes, afflictions, there shall be offense, there shall be hatred among brethren, and uh, so on and so forth. But as I read in the verse 6, the Bible says, when you see these things first, don't panic. And this really got me. These things must take place, that is in Matthew 24 verse 6, when you see these things first, don't panic. These things must, must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. So yes, wars. And when I grew up, I, uh, I was told, the end is near. So uh, I, I think people are alert, especially wakisikia kama Israel imeguzwa kama jana, Everyone was alert. Yakwamba, I think God can come anytime. When you hear of earthquakes, then you hear Nazinakuja like uh, recurringly over and over. So people again, they tend to be a bit scared like what is happening. But verse 14 uh, is what got my attention of Matthew 24, 14. That and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And then shall the end come. So yes, uh, there shall be wars, there shall be rumors of war, and the Bible says that this, the, the, the end will not just follow immediately. But the day you hear that there is a revival in Kazakhstan and Iran, and in all those places like Lebanon, where people don't know God, then know that the end is now near. Uh, my focus is on Matthew 24, 12. And the Bible says that, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The love of many shall wax cold. 
And I want us to read again 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to 4. Uh, let's read together kindly. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So we see that these are some of the certain signs of the end times, that the love of many shall wax cold. People shall be lovers of uh, self and money. Today, self and money is what drives our times and society. But godly character must come before money. Isn't it amazing that even after the pandemic, uh, it was reported in statistics that the list of billionaires was, was 100 by 100 people who became billionaires. All these people, they didn't, they didn't care. Even in Kenya, yes, there are people who we call today COVID billionaires. At the extent of people dying, they were still able to do what? To become billionaires. It doesn't matter. As long as I'm making money, it doesn't matter whether someone is dying, whether someone is doing what. Mimi, I will make money by all means. And that is the spirit that has gotten into people in these last days. That they can make money at the expense of anything. You tell someone, kill that person, I'll give you a million. They will kill him, even without blinking a bit. Selfish believers are driven by self and money only. Have money, get money, don't worry about how you get it. When you get it, you become important and people celebrate you whether you kill or lie. One of the ways to be celebrated or one of the ways to ascend to maybe to become uh, someone like an MP, have money. Through whichever means, whether crook or nini, you have money. If today you decide Edward Mulwa mutani um, support ni kwe MCA hapa. I just come na mimi ni wambia wandugu tafadhali muna nijua tu. Mimi ni kona faith na watoto, lakini nitawa serve. Mutasema sawa. Uh, someone else who inje, atenda a splash pesa in all the pubs. Atenda a splash pesa in every other place. Now that will be the icon. Uyo sasa ndiyo kuse, ndiyo kusema. Because he has what? He has money. So again, it says that they will be boastful. Uh, the Bible says in Jeremiah 9.24, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. So let our boasting be because we know God. Because we understand the ways of God. So if you are boasting in anything other than you know God, then your boasting is in vain and it's only for a time. Our boasting should be about our walk in God that indeed heavenly, uh, that you can be able to say that God, I am grateful. I can boast that these days I never used to wake up, but these days I wake up. I spend time in the secret place. I, these days I am able to go out and just tell someone about the word of God. And you remember like our fathers, when Bishop tells you of his story, when you hear of stories for uh, like for uh, J.B. Masinde Bishop and many other pastors and uh, bishops like Bishop Makarioki, when they were starting, it was just about God, how they will serve God, how they will do crusades. So the love of God was in them. There was no boasting in them. It was not about money. It was not about material things. It was about God who has called them and God who is able to do uh, great things through their lives. So as a believer, first thing when you wake up in the morning is your relationship with God. He is the source of our lives. And David said in Psalms 27, 1, that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? So when we, we wake up in the morning, the first thing we wake up should be to give God thanks and to praise his name 
for what he has done. Uh, the Bible talks of also people who are proud. People even before you ask. And you know, one day I was driving <laughs> and then um, unajua hizo siku uliko ukiwa kwa jam na mtu akutreaten kidogo unamuuliza do you know who i am do you know who i am so unfortunately i use that phrase nikatumia do you know who i am akaniambi huyo mtu akaniangalia hivi akaniambia i don't care who you are <laughs> and i think i was I, i was so bad up because i who am i <laughs> eh who am i ningefanya nini eh and uh, i remember again someone complaining in traffic and saying yeah bora tu kosea kwa barabara kila mtu anapenda kujifanya do you know who who i am una kila mtu kenya anajifanyanga ni kama polisi si ni kweli and again we deal with people based on our achievement or even their achievements we want because maybe this one so and so he has established so much and maybe he has accomplished so much in society so we want to give them even uh, lead roles so that at least we can be proudly associated neglecting maybe those that god is working on and is doing something in their lives again when we read we read of our blasphemers and uh, disobedient to parents and when we looked surely at today's generation uh, disobedient to parents is a big thing i uh, thank god you were ministered by professor last week which was good for us parents but most young people are controlled by passion that is social media generation all about passion all about self how do i make it how do i make more money now 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 and then there is ingratitude and unthankfulness Familiarity has become a big issue. We have developed a sense of entitlement. We take everything for granted. As husbands, we don't say even thank you to our wives when they cook a good meal. It's like two ni kawaida. As wives, you don't know the struggles of a man to bring money home. So wona mwangalia tu and you are like you are you are very ungrateful. Nothing really counts to you as a uh, uh, as a spouse to the other. So even when uh, it comes up to a point where even when someone just remembers you and sends you some money on Mpesa some people still have the audacity to say pesa nilipata lakini si ulisahau ya kufanya nini ya kutoa So we've become very ungrateful and unthankful and you remember the story of Vashti she forgot she was a queen and thought because of I'm um, first lady I can misbehave and she paid a heavy price because of familiarity always learn to be thankful uh, let's never get to a place where we become familiar with god and others but let us always have an attitude of gratitude anything anyone does for you say thank you in the morning when you see when you uh, maybe unachana na your spouse tell them thank you when you see your children in the evening tell them thank you your colleagues tell them thank you anyone that you serve with anywhere always have that uh, attitude of gratitude and holy and loving there are people you pour into them but it's never enough for them nothing you do is never enough for them they can't receive or even give love if you if you die for them they will say you fool who told you to die for for me because they are very uh unloving people so don't take advantage of the love uh either your parents or others show to you then unforgiving there are people who say i can't forgive mimi mimi ni same i will never forgive that brother i will never forgive that sister hata hata bishop kweli alipatwa vision ni either yeye aende shailo ama mimi nibaki wapi lakini kama atabaki hapa mimi nitaenda wapi shailo because i can't stand seeing this person you've become we've become so unforgiving if it's a spouse they remind you of the sins your great great grandfather 
you know, when you met, when you are still courting, they can still mention to you, you remember when we were courting, you did this and this to me. Make a mistake. They will remind you of the mistake until you die. They will never let go. They will always remind you of the same mistake. And the Bible says in Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I am he that blotted out transgressions for my own sake and will not remember thy sins. God says, I can't remember. Why remind others of their sins? If God forgives you and he doesn't remember, why do you remind others about their sins? And the Bible says in Matthew 6, 15, if you don't forgive others, neither will God forgive you. So yes, you want to be forgiven? Forgive others. If you don't, and it's a command, and if you don't want to forgive others, then be sure that God himself also will not forgive you. One of the stories that is told about uh, Nelson Mandela is that when he was leaving his prison uh, door, he said, if I don't leave behind my unforgiveness, bitterness, and offenses, I will walk through this door to freedom and I will still be in prison. So he knew the value of forgiving others. He knew the value of uh, doing away with bitterness and doing away with anything that is offend that anyone that has offended him. Learn to forget. Uh, forgive and let go. Forgiveness is a command. No matter what is done to us, the Bible doesn't say, though, you trust them. Forgive them though, but let them earn your trust after that, okay? You can forgive them, but whether to trust or not, they must earn your trust again. Let them show fruits of true repentance. That Yakwamba, I said this about you, it was false, I am rep have repented about it, and yes, I will work on it uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Then, uh, slanderers, self-control, you offend them, they break everything in the house, they tell you, I will show you who I am, and everything of that sort. Then, lovers of pleasure than self. You can't come to Kesha or midweek service, but rather, you can go to a nightclub every Friday, but the day they call for a Kesha, not even a full Kesha, just half Kesha, that is the day Yenyata Uwezi Patikana Hatakidogo. So, People will do anything for pleasure. Church is not a priority for them. Come for Monday prayers, it's not a priority for you. And if you are held up somewhere genuinely, then that is okay. Have a form of godliness, but deny its power. They have the form of God. They have the language. Act as believers. They know what to say and talk. And, uh, but at the end of the day, they fake everything. Uh, the Bible says we turn away so, from such who have a form but lack the Christian experience. They don't have a walk with God. They don't have an encounter with God. So we are looking at the signs of a lukewarm believer and church. That was just an introduction to certain signs of the end time. So when we come to the signs of a lukewarm believer, I want us to read the Bible in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, from verse 14 to 19. Kindly, if you can project. Let's read together. And to the angel of the church of the Lydosians write, These things say, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. 
So we are looking here at the, this was the message to the seventh church, which is the church of the Lydosia, believed to be the last one. It is believed to be where the current believers and the church is currently. Uh, God, he talks of, he starts by saying that God is the beginning of all creation. And it goes ahead to say that I know your works. I am the true and faithful witness. And I know where you are. I know your motives. I know your words. I know what drives you. I know what you do. This is God telling us, as much as we may try to hide, as much as we may try to be fake, God knows who we are on the inside. I know you in and out more than you even know yourself. I have a problem with you. You are neither hot or cold. And the God here is trying to say, take a stand so that I know how to deal with you. You are neither hot, you are neither cold, you are just at the fence. Why don't you take a stand so that I know how to deal with you? You have one leg in, one leg out. I will spit you out of my mouth. And I thought this is a very serious thing. You know, when you are spitting something out of your mouth, it is either it is tasteless, it has a lot of salt, it, it is a taste that you've never, uh, maybe ujazoya, that kind of taste in your mouth. And uh, one of the reasons that is given there as to why you are lukewarm, because thou sayest in verse 17, I am rich, I am loaded, I have deep pockets, and can buy whatever I want. I have increase in goods. I got all under my control. I don't need anybody. I'm self-sufficient. I'm okay. I'm good. I don't need you. I am rich. Kuja kanisa kufanya nini? And God says in verse 17, let me define you. Let me show you your true self. Let me show you your true picture of who you are and how I see you is different from how others see you. Because God sees you even in your nakedness. So don't define me by what I wear or possess. Our knowledge of him and relationship with him determines who we, we are. May God help us to stand the test of time. So sign number one of a lukewarm believer. And just before I go to that, the Bible says, uh, lastly, in, almost in verse 18, repent, that is turn around, give up those habits. And uh, I was taken aback to the story of a young evangelist. This young evangelist was visiting a town. And when he visited this town, the, can I say, maybe the, the, the host who had invited him, he saw him enter somewhere, but after he entered somewhere, he drove off. So whatever place he was entering was not a good place. But when he came, there was revival. Uh, God changed the lives of people. From that time, the church has never, rema never remained the same again. But he was bitter before God, and he went and told God, God, I saw this person enter through this place. How can you use him like this? And God told him, you better shut up. This person is new in town. You saw him enter, but because he was new in town, he, he quickly realized he had made a mistake and turned and went back. So you never saw that. And just before again, he was like, God, there's a lady here in church. She's been born again for 60 good years. Why don't you use her? Because everybody loves her. And God was clear. He told her, for the last 40 years, this lady has been walking in rebellion in my relationship with him. And these are the sins, spiritual sins. We only see the sins of the flesh, but they are serious spiritual sins. Arrogance, being critical of others, unforgiveness, taking offense, holding back what belongs to the Lord and due to him. Nothing can change you regardless of who is preaching. You can never change your stand. Even if Reinhard Bonke was to come back to life and preach, nothing can change your stand concerning what uh, you believe. So the first uh, sign of a lukewarm believer is that they don't have a consistent prayer life. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians uh, 1, 5, 17, pray without ceasing. And in the book of Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer 
with an, alight, with an alert mind and thankful heart. Continue in prayer. So you pray every now and then, but not consistent in a sign, not being consistent is a sign of lukewarmness. It's in the church and it's in among believers. And if you want to know that really this is a great symptom, come to Monday prayers. Then you will understand why we are saying that people have become uh, prayerless. They don't have a consistent prayer life. Call for a prayer meeting. A handful will come. Call for what? Family day. We are even looking for space. <laughs> right? But it's good. Eh? It's good to eat. I'm not against anything. Uh, number two, they don't read or meditate on the word of God. And the Bible says in Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and thou, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written. So they don't study the word consistently. When is the last time you just sat down, uh, took your Bible, took a notebook, you sat down and you really studied the word of God? When was the last time you did that? You don't have a grip on the word of God. You don't make time for the word of God. And the Bible says that the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So knowing scripture is what gives us access to his power. And Jesus is our perfect example. When he was led into the wilderness by the spirit, when the, devil, when the tempter came, he responded by the word. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. No wonder as Christians, most of the time we are falling because we don't have the word of God in our lives. Number three, they do not wait on God. Isaiah 40, 31 tells us, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Today's generation, we don't want to wait on God. We are in a haste. The microwave generation instant generation. We want everything sasa hivi. Na kama si sasa hivi ni hivi sasa. In 1 Corinthians 16 verse 8 and 9 Paul talks of I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Paul was saying he will tarry until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God revive us one more time that indeed the gifts of God may be stirred up in us. We need to tarry. We need to tarry. We need to, we need to be at the place of prayer. We need to wait on God because they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. If you want your strength to be renewed, then we need to wait on God. We need to tarry at the place of prayer. Number four, they complain, they murmur, they grumble against leadership. They are always complaining about the father, about the mother, about the politicians, about everything, about church leadership, about everything. They, nothing that they don't grumble about. Number five, they do not witness, don't share their faith, and don't evangelize. They don't care about anybody. Yes, we live with people who are unsaved, our neighbors, our colleagues, uh, maybe our family members, but do we take time to evangelize to them? Do we ever share about our faith? Do we take time uh, just to go and visit them and tell them, about Jesus. It's always about our deals. What is the next deal? Nitagonga deal gunning in the next. How do I make money again after this transaction? And we forget that we need to share our faith to someone. And maybe even if you can ask your neighbor, when was the last time you shared your faith with someone? When was the last time you really took time to say, Today I'm in this matatu, haina music, I will just say to this person that God loves them. When was the last time you did that? And remember that which you do for God has an eternal reward. God does not give salary, but he rewards. Amen? So don't live a Christian life that is costing you nothing. Don't wake up in the morning. You are not reading your word. You are not praying. You are complaining. You can't share even your faith with others. Then number six, they don't serve in the house of God. They don't serve they are not committed to anything in the house of God. They don't belong to home cells. They don't belong to networks. They only come to church on Sunday. On Sunday is only when they come to church. They are nobles. 
they have arrived in their own realm, they can't mingle with others. It's okay, they will give their tithe, they'll give their offering. But after the service is over, uh, maybe the pastors announce, uh, today let all men be left behind, let all the sisters be left, so that we at least, uh, we want to speak one or two things. They will be the first ones to leave. They have no burden at all for the work of God. They always look at people in cells and networks as people who are strugglers. All they have to do for them, they have arrived. They have the money. So anyone who is in church in any group, they are strugglers. But John, 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. So if you walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If you walk in the light, we have humility, we have grace, we have compassion. You see the need for others. And remember, these are the kind of people that a time shall come when you need others. When, it's, when something happens, that's when they realize that they really need the fellowship of brethren. So before it's too late, show commitment even now. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 5, the Bible says, And next unto them the tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their neck on the work of the Lord. Their nobles will, put their neck, will not put their neck on the work of the Lord. They won't take a risk. They won't make any effort. They will not be involved in anything concerning the church. They have arrived. They have influence. They feel they have influence because of maybe the, what they possess or how much they have. If you try to get them committed to anything, they fight you hard. If you tell them there is Father's vision, they tell you it's okay about the Father's vision, I'll think about it, and maybe they never make any commitment where that is concerned. It's even, uh, even as leaders, you become afraid to talk to such people because you don't know what their response will be. Uh, even if you try to tell them, Friday uh, kuna kesha, Uneza uh, kwa shida. Number seven, they hold back what is due to the house of God and others. And you know, one of the things is God has given each and everyone a skill and time. And this is what they hold back. And maybe even you are seated with someone, he usually comes to church, he looks at this church. And he says, given my knowledge, I know I can do one, two, three things to improve everything around here. But you sit with that talent. It may not only be that. It might be so many things that you are talented. And God wants you to use that also to advance his kingdom. So, and uh, the last one for today, they forsake the assembling together of God's people. They are not in fellowship with anyone. It's all about them. They serve God on their own terms and not on God's terms. They, there comes a day when the dust settles, when the curtains are drawn, when everything, when the water levels up, then you realize that you really need God. You realize that indeed, you, where you are, it's only God who can help you. And that is why someone like Hezekiah could tell God, God, remember my service for the work of God. Remember my sacrifice for the house of God, for the people of God. And just because of that, God was able to add him 15 more years. Today, if you are to present your case before God, what is it that you can tell God? What is it that you can tell God that you've sacrificed for the people of God? Like Hezekiah, may our service be needed in the house of God for many generations. That there shall be no need for God to say, you shall not die anytime soon. Because your service is still needed in the house of God. And just as I call the choir to come here, as I want to conclude, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2 says, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known in wrath. Remember 
mercy. And maybe what I've talked or what I've shared today, there's something you felt in your heart that indeed God, if it's my prayer life, I need to be consistent. If it's reading and meditating the word of God, then I've not done it to my best. If it's waiting on God, I've not really waited on you, God. I've not tarried in the secret place. When it comes to complaining and murmuring and grumbling, you know yourself, you complain about everything. And maybe you want to tell God, show me mercy. Maybe it's about being given service to the house of the Lord. People have approached you over and over. You have a good voice. Uh, you can make a good usher. But you've never made that decision to be useful in the house of God. Or maybe it is that you hold back what is due to the house of God and others. Your skills, your talents, they've really not been utilized in the house of God. And maybe it is that ever since you came to this church, you've never made it even for a Monday prayer meeting. You've never made it even for a midweek prayer service. And this is what Habakkuk is saying here, that, oh Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. Revive the work in the midst of the years. And we want to pray, if we can be all be upstanding, that Lord, revive me one more time and prolong my life that I may bring many generations to you. In wrath, remember mercy. Lord, show me mercy. Mercy for my shortcomings. Mercy for my pride. Mercy for arrogance. Mercy for unforgiveness. Mercy for stubbornness. Mercy, Lord, for love and self-pleasure. Mercy for my family. Mercy for my church. Lord, revive us. Lord, revive us. Just open up your mouth and tell God, God, revive me once more. Lord, help me. Lord, show me mercy. Show me mercy. In your wrath, O oh God, remember mercy. That indeed, Heavenly Father, I shall be the Christian that you desire me to be to the glory and to the honor of your name. Revive us, Lord, as DCIKZ family. Revive our cells meeting. Revive our networks, oh God. The men's networks, the ladies' networks, oh God. Revive our cell meetings, oh God. Revive our leaders, oh God. And show us mercy, oh God. To the glory and to the honor of your name, oh God. Forgive us, Lord, and have mercy. Say, eh, me go say.